Uh, yeah, but you see, one of the things I've heard the saying, which I think is uh, sums it all up, Cuba's a good place to be if you're poor. Not such a good place to be if you want to be rich. That's I think, very, I think, that's I think very that, untrue. That's very untrue, that, Rob. And I think that many of the people, many of the people that are, that are leaving are people who, you know, uh, if, the, if you were paying the kind of salaries that you're paying people in the, uh, in the West Havana uh, medical uh, uh, institutions that are there, uh, high class, world class, if you paid them the same salaries you paid in the United States, uh, you wouldn't have it in Cuba. It's just impossible. Uh, and those people, uh, those kind of people, are able to earn much more if they were if they ended up in the United States. And I think that uh, that that you know the, the 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 kind of people that are leaving are not are not the the poor people who generally have done better off uh, as a result of the of the, of the social system in Cuba. That is the problem. That's very really untrue. That is that they 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 remain a developing country. My name is Donald and welcome to Worldview. At Worldview we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. If you've liked our content so far and enjoyed it, please consider liking this video, subscribing and donating on Patreon. Today's debate we will focus on communism versus capitalism. Does South Africa need more state intervention or less? Taking the pro side aside for capitalism is Davi Root from the Efficient Group. Hello Donald. And for the con side, the side arguing for communism, we have Rob Davis, the former Minister of Trade and Industry, who, re who released a new book, Towards a New Deal, and is a former member, or sorry, a current member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Good evening. So, Davi, um, Ronald Reagan famously said, government is not the solution to our problem government is the problem. Do you agree or disagree with that statement and how would you apply it in a South African context? Yeah, thank you very much and uh, good evening also to you, Rob. It's very nice to share this platform with you. Uh, I think uh, we have to make a distinction here between two things. You, 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 in your introduction, you mentioned that I am on the, I'm on the, on the side of the capitalists. Now, I have to disagree a little bit if you call me a capitalist, because that is a, that is a term that was uh, invented by, by Karl Marx, if I'm not mistaken. And I think a, a capitalist is a person with a lot of capital. I, I would prefer if you refer to me as a, somebody that believes in free markets or believes in private individual freedom kind of thing. And the, the, on and, and the opposite side, the, you have a state intervention to be politicians tell you what to do. But coming back to your, your Ronald Reagan reference, uh, and certainly I think we have to also understand in the South African context is that there are two things. And I think this debate tonight is probably going to be about ideology. The debate is about the ideology of the individual freedom versus non-individual freedom or then communism. Uh, but we also have to understand that in the case of South Africa that we have an exceptionally corrupt and incompetent government. And I think we have to make a distinction between the ideology and the quality of government as well. It is quite possible that you can have a government that is a communist government that is far more efficient than a South African government, as an example. That doesn't mean necessarily communism is good or bad. Uh, and I think the point I'm trying to make is that the jockey is very important. It's not only the horse, the ideology, but it's mm. also important to use the actual jockey. Here. So we have to make a distinction there. And if we talk about South Africa, it is a disaster, the government that we have in South Africa, primarily because of the horrible jockey that we have in South Africa, although the ideology is completely wrong as well. So, yes, coming back to Ronald Reagan, I must, uh, broadly speaking, certainly agree with him. We, we have, in the case of South Africa, we have a completely wrong ideology. Uh, and to be, uh, on top of that, we have an exceptionally incompetent government as well. So, which is the most damaging part of government, I would guess that it is the incompetence and the corrupt government that's co probably causing far more damage uh, to the South African economy than the ideology itself. But I, I guess tonight is more about the ideology than anything else. So Rob, is government the problem? Well, I disagree with the uh, statement uh, of Ronald Reagan. And I think that uh, actually the uh, neoliberal reforms that uh, he uh, championed uh, didn't actually see government really declining in its importance, but actually government played a different role. And I think the real question is not the the size of the government or the 
uh, extent of, uh, of public ownership, it is the direction of uh, government policy that is important. And I think that the evidence around the world, and we'll come to that in some of the later questions, is that those developing countries that have succeeded in transforming themselves into developed countries or emerging markets uh, have all passed through a stage of industrialization in which the state has played a leading role and a developmental state has been critical to the uh, developmental efforts of, of those countries. And so uh, I think that we need uh, in South Africa, as in other developing countries, a developmental state following a developmental strategy. Now, um, I would agree with Darby that the um, aim and objective of trying to create that, which has been defined by the liberation movement for some time, has been blown off course by corruption, looting uh, and state capture. And so uh, instead of building a capable developmental state, we have destroyed a number of the institutions that ought to be part of this process uh, through, uh, through corruption. I don't believe that the solution for South Africa is that uh, that means we just abandon uh, any kind of uh, developmental role for the state. That would be, I think, uh, to set us back. Uh, what we need to do is we need to structure and create a more efficient and effective developmental state. That's the uh, direction forward. Otherwise, I think we will be at the uh, hands on the tyranny of the market. And the tyranny of the market is that those who have market power, those who have wealth and resources, uh, will determine the outcomes. And those that do not, the poor uh, and the working people, uh, will uh, uh, be the ones who will lose out. But I think, uh, okay, so yeah, David. Yeah, okay, well, we can talk about the tyranny of the state as well, and South Africa is an excellent example of that. And it's not only the past 10 years or the Zuma years that led to all this destruction happening in the South African economy. It happened before that as well. Uh, but maybe what we a good starting point will be to ask the question, so what is the role of the state? Now, since uh, Rob is defending the communist side, and I'm defending the opposite side, uh, I think, uh, from my point of view, the most important primary function of the state is to protect people and to protect their stuff. And there, the South African government has been a complete and a total disaster. Uh, for example, a very good one is that one of the... We can, we can debate whether the state should be involved in things like, for example, infrastructural development or in, involved in education or health services or so on. But everybody will probably agree that the state's primary function is to protect people and to protect their stuff. Now, I can give you many examples. We've just heard, for instance, that Rio Tinto decided to, to, to stop the operations in, um, in the northern KZN because the state is not doing what's supposed to be doing, and that's to protect your investments and to protect even the lives of people. Um, so, so I would argue that the primary function for the state, you can include developmental stuff maybe a bit later, and we can talk about that, but the primary function of the state is certainly protection and they, they can't even get that right so i can't see in south africa how we can have a developmental state that gets involved in all sort of stuff like education or some sort of uh, industries or picking winners in the economy if they can't even do the basic stuff and that is to protect people and to protect people's stuff so yeah um i think we should perhaps avoid uh, corruption because I, I think obviously you both disagree that or agree that that's uh yeah. not to uh, it's depriving us of the state that we need. But um, I think Darby would agree that socialism and communism basically goes hand in hand with corruption. That if the state grows bigger and bigger, corruption will increase. So that's, that's the case, yes. So uh, social and cosm communism is part of the problem and we, c we can't have efficient government with it. So I would say in response to that, is that uh, if we want to look at the example of corruption in South Africa, uh, a lot of this can be traced back to the adoption uh, at the time of the 90s of uh, what was called new public management, uh, which was driven by uh, the, 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 the pressure towards uh, neoliberalism. And what this meant was that the state, instead of providing services directly, the state became a procurer of services from private interest groups, from private uh, uh, companies and corporations. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the real uh, looting that took place in South Africa, it was at that interface, uh, that interface between the public as a procurer uh, and uh, the private sector as a supplier. And I think that the private sector was very far from immune uh, from uh, being involved in the uh, state capture and corruption that we've just gone through. 
So I think that uh, it doesn't help us to, to we can throw, I think, uh, uh, darts at each other. Uh, but uh, probably we would agree that the state catch and corruption uh, has damaged the South African economy. I, I don't believe that the solution to that, though, is to say that, well, the, the government is so incompetent that the government should just step aside and the government should not do any other things that are actually quite critical for uh, the development of the productive forces in this country and for this country escaping from its position in the global division of labor as simply a producer and exporter of primary products. It's got to move as the continent has got to move into a different space where we are also producers of value-added products. Yeah, Rob, I don't disagree with you that there certainly is corruption in the private sector as well. Uh, but there's far more corruption in the public sector, and it makes absolute lo logical sense why there's more, more production in the, in the public sector. And that has to do with the fact that if the state gets bigger, then the state quite often becomes a monopoly. Uh, quite often, we in the private sector, we are completely and totally dependent on licenses or permits or whatever from the state. And if the state is, and the state uses that, and the, the agents of the state quite often use that as an additional source of income. So certainly, you do need the private sector in many instances uh, for, corruption, for corruption to happen, but it's the structure where we have a huge state that forces quite often people to become, become corrupt because you don't have a choice. You either pay me or you're not going to get a license, as a very good example. But I would like to, if I may, uh, Donald... I would like uh, to, to go to the, to, the, to the real, to the core of the difference between what you call a capitalist system and a, and a communist system. And I would argue that, that the, the, the core of the difference between these two systems is private property rights. Um, and a, a private property rights is of the utmost importance because without private property rights, you cannot trade, you cannot exchange private property, and if you cannot exchange private property through trade, then you can't get this amazing thing called trade, which eventually will lead to modern economies. And what is, which is a bit of an irony for me is to have a communist uh, like Rob Davies to have been South Africa's uh, Minister of Trade in the past. And that simply didn't make sense to me. How can you have a communist which doesn't believe in private property rights to be the Minister of Trade? How could the ANC think of even appointing a communist to that specific position? And we have another communist today as the Minister of Trade and Industry in South Africa as well. Rob? Well, let me, let me just say that uh, I think that the most significant developmental experience in economic history is that which took place under a communist government in the People's Republic of China, where you had communists in charge of ministries of industry and of trade uh, who uh, set out a strategic engagement in international trade in a market system, which is uh, still in existence. And I think bear in mind also that uh, the, 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 the Marxist classics have always been very clear that socialism is a transitional arrangement over a long period of time uh, in which market relations will continue to exist, but in which also social direction and the, uh, the steering away from a system in which uh, production is totally for profit, in which people's needs are actually uh, also shaping the direction of production and trade is, 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 is an essential part of the equation. And that has driven the most successful uh, industrialization and developmental uh, uh, episode uh, in the history of humanity in the, in the recent times anyway. And so I think that, uh, uh, you know, the, the idea that uh, uh, communists uh, don't know how to operate in markets uh, is, uh, is, 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 is patently not, not the case. Uh, but also uh, the idea that uh, the People's Republic of China uh, was simply something that, uh, that, that, that just decided that it would operate uh, according to the logic of free markets and uh, profit and capital accumulation is also not the case. So I think that uh, I, I don't want to hold up any example as, as any kind of utopia or absolute example, but I do think that there are lessons uh, that can be drawn from the experience, for example, of China, uh, of Vietnam for that matter, and at another level from a country like Cuba, uh, which has prioritized its health and education uh, and uh, sits 41 places higher on its human development index than it, is, uh, than it does on its GDP per capita. If, if, so yeah. I think that these are all examples of where I think uh, uh, a developmental state uh, has produced uh, results that are beneficial uh, to the ordinary people of the country. Concerned. If I could ask one follow-up question to that, um, why did communists like to focus on China, but not, for example, Taiwan, 
Hong Kong, Singapore, or Japan? Aren't they in a better state than China? Well, I, 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 I doubt that. I mean, they had a, a very successful industrialization themselves, uh, were driven by a developmental state and quite authoritarian governments in, the, in, in, in many cases. So that experience of uh, the, uh, of, of the uh, uh, East Asian countries in the 1970s and 80s was also a very significant lesson uh, of uh, industrialization. But I think the, the biggest transformation, which has lifted hundreds of millions of people from poverty, uh, has been China. Uh, yeah. And uh, it, is, it is the Chinese experience, which I think stands out uh, as, uh, as, as if you want the high watermark uh, of uh, developmental states. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I have to agree with that. In fact, that the Chinese, I mean, but that, that's, a China, that's an economic miracle that happened there. But the economic miracle happened there from 1978 onwards when Deng Xiaoping became the leader in China. And what the, he famously said, it doesn't matter what the color of the cat is as long as it catches the mouse. And essentially what happened then is that they started liberalizing the economy and it was market forces, the freedom of market forces that led to this astonishing growth of economic uh, activity in, in China. And they succeeded in uplifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. But it was not communism. They said they're getting rid of communism, actually, that led to this an astonishing economic growth. But I, I do need to ask Rob this because... Because uh, communism, I, the ideology of communism simply means that, private, that property vests in the state. And the biggest question, the biggest downfall to any the theoretical downfall to the communist idea is simply how do you know what to make? In the case of the, fr the free market system, it's very easy to understand what to make. The market keeps on telling you all the time. But in the case of a real communist system, and I've studied Soviet Union, I've studied all these other silly communist states of the, and, and even though some of them today, like for example, North Korea, it's a very good example of a so-called developmental state. But, but I want to ask Rob, is what do you know, how do you know what to make in a communist system? Because what, what happened in practice is that they had committees and they had committees on committees and they had armies of economists deciding how to allocate scarce resources. And they've got it wrong every time. It led to inferior production and very really unproductive production in all those economies, with the exception of countries that moved away from the central control, like, for example, in the case of China. So, but theoretically, how do communists know what to make? I know it happens in a free market system, but how do you know what to make in a communist system? Well, I think that the, the you know there's a there's a bit of a caricature that the uh, that that the essence of socialism is the state owns all property. Uh, as I said, it's a transitional stage, uh, and uh, I think the essence of what is uh, being sought under 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 uh, in the socialist uh, phase uh, is not necessarily nationalisation, as understood as just a simple transfer of property rights to the state. It's what's called socialisation, and the classics have been very clear that this is something quite different, and this is a process in which. Uh, Working people and the poor gain progressively and incrementally uh, influence over the, the, the uh, uh, economic power, uh, which is the determination of where the, source the surplus goes, how it's invested and so on, and also gaining progressively and incrementally uh, the powers of possession, the powers of, in, of control over actual enterprises. And I think that the, the, the Soviet system um, had its weaknesses and it collapsed. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the SACP and, and Joe Slovo, uh, onwards, we've, we've looked at that and we've said this is not what we're seeking to create uh, in, in South Africa. So I think that uh, what we would have is a, 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 a system in which there is still commodity production, there's production for exchange, uh, and it can take place in, 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 in a, a variety of, of, of forms of ownership of property. But the critical thing is that there will be a, 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 a direction coming from a, a, a state which has to be a democratically entrenched state and not a, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I, I would not for one second want to hold out uh, North Korea as any, as any example, uh, but it would, it would have to be a, 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 a state that's responding to the, to the needs and aspirations of people and which directs uh, production, consumption, and, and in particular development, because if we don't have that, I think that market mechanisms on their own tend to reproduce the relations of power relations in which those who have the wealth have got the uh, influence and the others uh, have little influence. And it's uh, an unelected group of people uh, who own wealth who actually determine most of the policy outcomes. 
And I think that what is particularly clear about China is although, yes, it did mean a departure from some of the Soviet-style policies that they had in the past, it did not embrace the kind of neoliberal policy perspectives that were advocated at the time by the United States. So in the 1980s, 1990s, we were all told that the, uh, the great question had been solved and the free market capitalism a la the United States uh, was uh, the, only, the only form of civilization that could take place. Well, that argument is looking rather thin right now, where we have growing inequality, where we have all the developing countries that have followed the neoliberal playbook have basically stayed where they, where they ever were. And the only uh, few exceptions, those who have industrialized, have manifestly not followed that playbook. They didn't allow their banks to become traders in paper and financialized institutions. They, did, they, they had an active industrial policy uh, that yeah. sought to shape the direction okay. uh, of development. And so I think that's the, that's the list of economic yeah. history for me. Yeah, well, well, don't for one moment think that I agree with all the policies in the United States. I think there are many, many, it's kind of socialist kind of policies that they're following in the United States, even what they're doing currently. The interventions of their central banks and the fiscal policies at the moment, I think that's going to turn out quite bad eventually. In the short term, it's quite nice, but eventually it's going to turn out quite bad. So don't think I necessarily support all of those. But your, your, your arguments about inequality is simply wrong, simply untrue, because the, the, the countries in the world with the lowest levels of, of inequality, uh, uh, the most equal societies in the world are all rich countries, are all countries that protect private property rights, that protect individual freedoms. The real inequality in the world you actually do get in places like, for example, in China. That is usually the case for developing countries and once they become wealthier, for example, then inequality becomes, more, uh, people become far more equal and inequality becomes much less of a problem. In the case of South Africa, for example, the reason why we have very, very high levels of inequality is mostly because of the ANC government. One simple example is that if you employ uh, 2 million civil servants and you completely overpay them, then that leads, that contributes to inequality as an example, but without a doubt. Wealthy societies are societies with low levels of inequality. Poor societies are countries with higher, much higher levels of inequality. But I still want to get the answer. You say socialism is a transition phase, and eventually we're going to become communists, all of us. But even in a communist system, we must somehow know how to allocate the scarce resources. And still you haven't answered that specific question. How are you going to know what to make in a pure communist system? Theoretically, I know this is a theoretical question. Well, I think that, um, uh, you know, that's uh, something that uh, I would, uh, you know, want to go back to uh, Deng Xiaoping, if you like. Uh, we will uh, observe, uh, you know, we will, we will cross the, the, uh, the river uh, following the stepping stones. We will learn as we do. Uh, and I think that uh, also, um, as Chris Harney said, I think that, that socialism, the case for socialism, is not about big theoretical debates. It's about the existence of poverty, inequality and unemployment. I want to uh, uh, say to Darby that I think that the societies in the world that are the most unequal are actually countries like ours, which are the, the sort of semi-peripheral or emerging markets, uh, us, Brazil, and other countries like, like us, where we have actually a sort of Western enclave stuck in amongst the sea of underdevelopment. And so much yeah. poorer countries are more, are more equal. Uh, and it's, it's, it's that inequality between the, the rich world and the poorest of the world that is the biggest. I mean, this is the situation where we have a few hundred dollar billionaires who have as much wealth as the bottom half of the world. Uh, this is the system that has been created. And what's happened now is I think that the inequality since the uh, adoption of, uh, you know, what I think Darby's arguing for. Uh, um, I, I think that, that, that uh, um, uh, uh, the U.S. administration, the, the, the Biden administration, uh, at the moment is, is trying uh, to recover from the, from the COVID crisis and trying to do so by deploying its resources up to 20 to 25 percent of its GDP uh, in important programs. I think that we need to learn some lessons from that in, in my book. But the, but the, uh, the thing is that, 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 that what I think is, 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 is critically important is that, is that the, the, the neoliberal policies that were pursued were never do that, always pursue a budget deficit which is uh, lower than 3%, always fight inflation, whatever, even if it's moderate, it must come down, and privatize, liberalize. And what has that delivered? That has delivered a world of 
growing inequality in which uh, the, the salaries and wages of working people across the world, the developed developing country have gone down, in which uh, monopoly conduct has, has, has become rampant uh, and in which uh, profits for monopoly corporations have gone up uh, considerably and uh, there are figures that have been done by UNCTAD and others that show this. Uh, and uh, that I think that this inequality now is, 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 is leading to situations where you know, we, we, we got massive intellectual property rights, which are, which are a monopoly, uh, mm. in the name of allowing people to, to innovate and produce things that we need, but have gone reach much beyond this. And this is, this is allowing all kinds of monopoly conduct that's creating, for example, vaccine apartheid across the world. So I think mm. that this is the world that's being created by the sort of neoliberal policies that I think Darby is advocating. Yeah, but, 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 but uh, are you... If I use your definitions for so-called neoliberal policies, uh, where you say things like, for example, uh, you mentioned inflation, you mentioned fiscal policy, monetary policy and fiscal policy, and the way that is conducted in a new liberal kind of fashion, then we haven't had new liberalism in the world for the, at least the past 10 years. You can simply look at the fiscal debt levels uh, internationally. Fiscal debt levels are the highest, in many cases, the highest ever. That's not a sign of new liberalism, according to your definition. Look at monetary policy as an example. Monetary interest rates internationally are the lowest they've ever been. In some instances, they're below zero. And it's not only short-term interest rates, it's even long-term interest rates as well, so-called quantitative easing. Uh, certainly, if that's your definition of new liberalism, we haven't had new liberal, liberalism internationally, but we've had exceptionally accommodative fiscal and monetary policy. And I do agree with you, is that this exceptional monetary, especially monetary policy, actually contributed to the inequality. Because what happens is that if you cut interest rates to ridiculously levels like what we you have internationally that is very good for equity prices, as an example, for financial instruments. And it's usually the, the wealthier people that they get the benefit from that and not the poor. But that's certainly not your definition of neoliberalism. It's exactly the opposite that we've had the past 10 years and longer, in fact, worldwide. Well, actually, what I think has happened is that the, the, we had neoliberalism, which was introduced where we started uh, with uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And then taken up uh, in multilateral institutions and this process of globalization that took place. And that this neoliberalism uh, created uh, a, 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 a uh, well, with the deregulation of the financial systems, it created financialization, ballooning financial yeah. systems, and financial systems that were not uh, uh, providing uh, capital for investment in productive economies but which were creating derivatives and securities and were trading paper uh, and uh, a highly speculative economy entered into a massive crisis uh, a bit more than 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, I think that what's happened since then is that uh, there's been a little bit of backpedaling uh, from the neoliberal playbook. But actually what's really been happening is that the developed world has been backpedaling when it suits itself from the neoliberal playbook but has continued to preach what it doesn't practice to all the rest of us. And I think that's the problem that we, that we find ourselves in. So I don't think that the solution to the crisis that we're in now, uh, the crisis of, 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 of COVID, the looming crisis of climate change, that is, is, is not to try to go back to a system which patently didn't work uh, from the 90s until the uh, 2008 uh, Great Recession. Uh, we actually need to find a, uh, a, a, a way out of this that uh, eventually allows developing countries in the African continent and elsewhere uh, to find their place as uh, in higher value added activities. If we don't, uh, as we go through things like the fourth industrial revolution, as we go into the lower carbon economy, if all we are going to be is the consumers of products produced elsewhere, I think that we are going to find ourselves in an even worse position uh, than we're going to find them than we already find ourselves in. And that's why we need a developmental state to lead a process of transformation. Uh, and also to address, I think, the fact that it's not that there's win-wins for everybody. Uh, and the, the, the playbook mm. for neoliberalism was, was there, it was preached, it was practiced, it was enforced uh, on many countries. And I don't think there's any case of any country that followed that playbook, any developing country that succeeded in transforming itself. But there are a couple of cases of developing countries which didn't follow the playbook and which did transform themselves. And I think that's an important lesson. Yeah. Well, Rob, you know, you were the minister in Zuma's uh, cabinet uh, for, a, for a couple of years. And uh, I just I did a, just a few Google searches today. 
uh, on a couple of things that you were uh, involved in. Like, for example, you were very much against capital inflows in South Africa. You were very much against foreigners investing in South Africa. Um, and I can give you many other. South Africa basically deindustrialized the past 20 years. Uh, and there are so many examples of that. South Africa, it was, it was a disaster what is happening in South Africa. So clearly, um, from, from seeing that the results of, of, of your policies and your government's policies the past couple of years, uh, that simply did not work. Uh, you can't blame the international world for all of that. In many instances, you took decisions with, uh, with the, the result that was not certainly not good for the South African e economy. So I'm afraid your, your policies that you tried to implement was part of the problem and led to the, to the collapse of the South African economy to a large ex extent. Well, let me just clarify that uh, you said we were against uh, a foreign investment at, at one stage um, in the early part of the uh, time when I took over. We had, uh, as a result of quantitative easing, we had uh, short-term capital coming into South Africa, not uh, foreign direct investment, short-term capital. Uh, and um, this was uh, leading to a, uh, a, a, an inflation of the, of the exchange rate, uh, as it did in, in, in other uh, emerging economies at the time. Now, one of the things that China did was they always kept their currency competitive. That was the way in which they managed to ensure that their exports were competitive and that uh, there wasn't an over-penetration of their own domestic market. They, they did that. That's one of the complaints that the US and various others had against China, but that's what they did. They managed their currency. And I was basically arguing at that time that we needed to uh, try to act to, to, to uh, not allow ourselves to have an overvalued currency. Now, that's history because... We certainly don't have an overvalued currency now. Uh, the other point I would make is that um, I've written about it in my book. Um, I think we tried industrial policy. We didn't have an industrial policy before. We actually started to, I think, really uh, deindustrialize and experience premature deindustrialization when we were obliged by the World Trade Organization and then went further under gear to over liberalize. Uh, the manufacturing tariffs uh, to the detriment of manufacturing industries in our country. We didn't have a strategy uh, to build them. Now, I think that uh, in, in my time, I think we showed that uh, in a few cases where we, where we did act purposefully, we did have develop the, the correct strategies and so on, uh, where we did uh, bring in all the, all the relevant players, uh, we showed the industrial policy worked. However, I don't think that we had what we have in, in, in what, what other uh, successful industrializing countries had, uh, which was the high level buy uh, and the uh, single focused laser like attention to industrial policy of successful industrializers. We had many, many competing agendas, including at the end of the, end of the day, uh, the uh, agendas of state capture and corruption. So I was never happy to see uh, the uh, shenanigans going on in, in ESCOM or Transnet uh, because they meant uh, higher prices for. Uh, you know, and, and mm. unreliable supplies, uh, but also localization, which I'm sure is a policy you don't support. Uh, localization, where we said that the government would buy certain percentages from uh, locally uh, produced uh, uh, manufactured inputs into infrastructure programs. Mm. Uh, all the bank tenders, uh, all of them without exception, someone will show me one that doesn't uh, conform with this, and, I, and, then, uh, and, I, and then I might be persuaded of the opposite, but all of them. Uh, supported imports against uh, locally produced products. So I think that uh, all of those things undermined our efforts. I don't think it, it, it says that uh, the efforts itself was wrong or that the, uh, the lessons that we were trying to take from other more successful industrializing economies were wrong, yeah. uh, but there were circumstances in South Africa where uh, things didn't work out as, as, as we would have liked them to work yeah. out. And, and look, I think that uh, as, as you see now, as you say now, uh, circumstances probably are improving. Uh, and that there will be a, a, a hopefully uh, a much uh, le lower level uh, of uh, looting and, and, and corruption uh, in our society. And then hopefully some of these policies yeah. will work more effectively in the future. Yeah, yeah. just one or two comments on that. You know, I can remember you were against the Walmart transaction as an example. You were against the, the Koreans buying a, a significant stake in Talcom. Uh, they, they are a world leader, the South Koreans, not the North Koreans, the communists, and the, the free market loving South Koreans, they are they wanted to buy a significant stake in Telcom and you were against that as well. Just imagine if we allowed them to do that, then we could have been in the forefront of technological changes as well. Exactly the same way Korea is today. 
But your comment about the currency is completely wrong. I do a lot of calculations on the currency. Um, and I can tell you the South African currency at the moment is a hugely undervalued currency. You don't need to undervalue the currency in order to be competitive internationally. Um, in the case of South Africa, it's usually undervalued the South African government, uh, the South African currency, because some people simply do not have trust in the South African government. And you can see, you can see it not only in the currency, you can see it in the capital market interest rates as well. Um, so no need to weaken the currency. The queer currency has very weak queries at the moment. Well, I, I, I wasn't talking about now. I was talking about the years immediately after 2008, 2009, when everybody, including the IMF, said that the currency was overvalued by about 10 to 15 percent. And this was having a negative effect on, on, on exports of manufactured goods. And also we were starting to see imports of things that we never used to import before. So I think that's the, that's the point I was, I, was, I was making there. Uh, just to, to clarify, we weren't against the Walmart transaction. We wanted to set conditions that Walmart would have to procure some of the products that it was selling in its shops from local sources. That was the, the, the negotiation, the deal eventually, uh, that we struck uh, with Walmart. I wasn't closely involved with the telecom issue, uh, but uh, you know that was a decision of a collective I was involved in, so I don't have to accept that responsibility. But that, that was the, the, the approach uh, which, which we had. Uh, and uh, in other words, um, you know, uh, a country like Australia, all foreign investments have to go through a board which approves or disapproves them. They've hardly disapproved any. But most of the foreign investments that have come in have been set with one or other condition. Uh, that is uh, part speaking to the developmental path of, of, of Australia. But that was the approach that we were trying to adopt yeah. in, the, in the case of the, of the, of the Walmart transaction. Mm. I must, uh, Donald, if I just can just uh, say something about, uh, about Rob. Sure. And that is that um, I personally believe that uh, he's, um, I, th I, don't, I think he's clean. I think he was, he's, he's a real ideologue. <laughs> uh, I think he's, uh, in his heart, you, you are a real communist, Rob, I believe, I really believe so. And I think you're a good person. People like you. But I think there's something that you're missing out, you and people like, for example, Pravin Goran, you are, you're missing something out. Do you really want this this idea of communism to work you you've got you've got a theoretical background you really believe in communism and you want to implement that you're trying to put all sort of things in place in order for this for this system to be implemented and for the for the betterment of all south africans i really believe that is what you believe unfortunately the reality is that there are real there are quite uh, there are few real ideologues like you in the in the in the government and in the tripartite alliance the anc government today the ANC and Kusato and, and, and the Communist Party today, it's basically one massive patronage. They're simply living off the state. And I can't believe how people like you that really, and I believe you really want, want to implement certain policies for the good of all South Africans. But every time it doesn't work, and it doesn't work for two reasons. The one is it can't work because there's this thing called communism um, is... Is, is intellectually simply unconvincing. It is philosophically weak. It's imper empirically been proven to be one thing. It, that's the one thing. But more importantly, is that the, the, the ANC government today simply exists because they want to live off the state. Your colleagues in the ANC, most of them, simply do not believe in your ideology. They go along for the right, they use the terminology, and they use the rhetoric because that puts them in a powerful position to keep on living off the state. But they're not ideologically aligned really with you. And I think that's where you and people like Robin Gordon are making a huge mistake. Unfortunately, well, we've come to the end of the line now. The South African economy is so deep in trouble. The state-owned enterprises have been destroyed financially and operationally. The fiscal accounts is totally and completely unsustainable. And everything, just about everything the ANC touches is a disaster. And I can go through the list, everything. Education is of the worst in the world. Health services, I don't even have to tell you what is going on. We can all see that at the moment. The police service has collapsed for all practical purposes. The local authorities are a disaster, all of them. And I'm afraid to say it is because of the ideology of communism, but more importantly, it's simply because of the incompetence of a, of a huge patronage system under the leadership of the ANC. Well, I, I don't really want to get into a big debate about, uh, uh, you know, where the, the extent of corruption and whether there's just a handful of people who are not. I think that there are 
Uh, for example, the president now is 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 leading a, a massive cleanup campaign and is 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 fighting some very very tough political battles, uh, and uh, he's got the full support of the South African Communist Party and Kosati in, in that. Uh, um, so, um, uh, but I I would just simply say that uh, I don't think that patronage, corruption, and so on. Uh, is linked to uh, to uh, 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 a communist ideology. Now, it's not that the ANC uh, uh, has accepted that either. Uh, the ANC is a, a national liberation movement and is a much broader a church than the than the SACP. But you have to look at a place like the um, Zaire under Mobutu, uh, where they had an outright capitalist ideology, but where the looting was on a scale which I think makes ours look a, a little bit uh, modest by comparison. So yeah. I don't think that. That, that 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 you can you can you can relate uh, state capture and corruption. I think they were a deviation from uh, the national democratic policies that the ANC stood for. A big deviation, a serious deviation, and one that is uh, costing us dearly in terms of the capacity we need yeah. uh, to move further forward. Uh, but I think that um, really what I want to say is that I I, I think that 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 uh, you know. Um, Saying things like, uh, you know, uh, drawing examples from, if you want, North Korea or the Soviet Union and all of that, and say this is the essence of, of, of socialism, is a little bit like saying that uh, capitalism, which grew up at the time of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, uh, is inextricably linked with child labor uh, and whatever. And I think that, of course, capitalism developed in a certain way and then it, yeah. it, it, it went to different iterations and became a somewhat different animal later on. But nonetheless, I think you're still the, uh, the, the, the driving of economic activity by the putting of profit above people in too many instances is creating a world which is uh, dangerously unable to confront the, uh, the huge challenges that lie ahead in any kind of inclusive uh, uh, manner uh, and which uh, could threaten to divide the world up into enclave communities and the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, would be a recipe for huge disasters in the future. And I think that the, the socialist alternative is something that we will be starting to learn as we move along. I'm not holding out uh, as, as a, uh, you know, an example of everything that we should all be just copying, China. But I do think that China has shown that a developmental state with the right disciplines attached to it and with you know, very serious anti-corruption elements built in. So if you want to say corruption is linked to communism, well, what, what about that? Uh, that yeah. they, uh, they have succeeded in, in developing their country so that it is now becoming the, uh, you know, in a few years' time, it will be the largest economy in the world. And a country like Cuba, which has not succeeded in doing that, has nonetheless succeeded in developing a world-class health system with, with vaccine capacity that, you know, 99% of the vaccines in Africa are imported, Cuba produces vaccines that are even consumed in the United States and also an education system. So I think that there are examples of where uh, the profit motive has been subordinated to a developmental or a, a social uh, imperative where there have been good results for the benefit of the people. And I think these are the stepping stones that we will be building on uh, if, as we move further forward. If we allow the world to be dominated by profits, uh, uh, pursuit of profit in the years that lie ahead, I don't think that we're going to find a future that the majority of working people and the poor are going to, are going to benefit from. On the other yeah. hand, we start to have a, a, a social direction uh, that progressively hmm. and incrementally moves us in that direction. I think that's the only way that uh, humanity okay. as a whole can benefit. Yeah, I I must say that uh, much of you, what you just said, I actually agree with. It doesn't necessarily mean if you're communist that you're corrupt, but with the biggest state, chances are that there's going to be more corruption. But, you know, you refer to, to, to Cuba a couple of times now, um, and, you know, we can debate all the ideologies and all that, but the, the reality is that nobody is fleeing to Cuba, and a lot of Cubans are fleeing to the United States. That is the reality. And the reality on the, for the man on the street is that an economy system and a, and a highly centralized system, like, for example, in Cuba, is that freedoms like individual freedoms, the right of movement, the right to owning property, the right of doing your own thing, and the right to, uh, to run a successful business. That is, to a large extent, limited. And that's why people are, uh, are trying to get out of Cuba, not kind of feeding back into Cuba. Uh, yeah, but you see, one of the things I've heard the saying, which I think is, uh, sums it all up, Cuba is a good place to be if you're poor. 
not such a good place to be if you want to be rich. That is think, very, think, that's very that, untrue. That's very and untrue, Rob. That, and I think that many of the people, many of the people that are, that are leaving are people who, you know, uh, if, the, if you were paying the kind of salaries that you're paying people in the, uh, in the West Savannah uh, medical uh, uh, institutions that are there, uh, high class, world class, if you paid them the same salaries you paid in the United States, uh, you wouldn't have it in Cuba. It's just impossible. Uh, and those people, uh, those kind of people, are able to earn much more if they were if they ended up in the United States. And I think that uh, that that you know the 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 kind of people that are leaving are not are not the the poor people who generally have done better off uh, as a result of the of the, of the social system in Cuba. That is the problem. That's very that Cuba is that they 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 remain a developing country. Uh, that is that is their problem. I mean, they're a very small country, a very small island. They were linked up to the to, to Comic Con, and when that disappeared, and the sanctions and the embargo they've been under have had tremendous negative effects on on, on Cuba. Nonetheless, they have made great strides forward. They are forty-one yeah, I mean, places yeah. uh, in the development index. Yeah, that's very untrue about you know being poor. It's good to be in Cuba, for example, if you're poor. That is that's completely untrue. I mean, all the statistics point. Uh, to the fact that if you want to be poor, it's better to be poor in a rich country than to be poor in a poor country, like, for example, in Cuba. Well, you know, um, uh, I recall uh, some years ago, Robert McNamara, who became the uh, head of the World Bank, just before 1994, he, 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 said he, he, he was having a, a, a recant on uh, all of the programs and policies he'd been part of, the Vietnam War and everything. And he said at a meeting in South Africa, he said, you know, he said that... Uh, the, there are uh, poor people in Washington, D.C., who are worse off than, uh, than people in Cuba. Uh, he'd been there and he'd looked at he'd done the research. So I think that, uh, you know, that is the situation. Uh, I don't think it's great to be a, a, a homeless, poor person in uh, many parts of the United States. Uh, and, uh, you know, there you are. At least in Cuba, you'll get uh, shelter and education and opportunities. Yeah, I, I think one of the problems here is we don't really have a communist in the traditional sense, and we don't really have a capitalist in the traditional sense. So mm -hmm. we are nitpicking, nitpicking the data, and we're arguing over small points. But I want to end on a more positive note on what would you both agree on? So, for, for example, Davi, would you agree on a universal basic income, getting rid of completely, getting rid of the welfare state? And just replacing it with a, like a blank check every month for every yeah. year. Yeah, you know, you know, uh, you will probably be surprised uh, for of my answer now, and that is a universal basic income grant. For example, I I might actually accept something like that, but and there's always a but. Um, I believe that the individual should have freedom, and I believe that if I want to spend money on a poor person because I want to uplift that poor person, it is much better to give that poor person money. And let that poor person take responsibility for spending the money on whatever he thinks is important for him. I, I, I shouldn't prescribe to a poor person, I think you must spend your money on A, B, and C. Give the money to him and he can spend it on whatever he wants to. So if we are talking about a, a, a basic income grant, I'm actually prepared to say, yes, let's see if we can give a basic in income grant in South Africa. But then we have to take away the other grants. Then we have to take away the child support grant. We have to take away the, the uh, old age grant. We have to stop spending money on education, for example, and on health services and stuff like that, but give people the money to spend it on health services or education, whatever they want to themselves. Uh, so from that point of view, yes, I will certainly be in favor of a basic income grant, but we can't. We cannot have all these other things that we have currently. Uh, and on top of that, we put an additional basic income grant. The reason is simply we can't, we can't afford it. I've just mentioned the fiscal accounts is in, a, is in very deep trouble already. But apart from that, is that you're going to create such a huge dependency on the state is, is that people will eventually stop working. Uh, and I've done all these kind of numbers. Is that, And I'm not against poor people getting wealthier and poor people getting get, trying to get a better life. That's exactly what they want in South Africa. But the social spending in South Africa is so huge already and so massively inefficient is that the taxpayer simply cannot afford it anymore. So the basic income grant, you may be able to convince me it's a good idea, provided that we do A, B, and C, like I've said. And Rob, for example, um, let's say you get everything you want. You get nationalized health care. But why do we need a minister of health? 
can't we delegate it to a provincial level or even a local level? Why do we need all these ministers? Can't we have a more federalist approach? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we need a, 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 con a consistency uh, uh, across government in terms of all the kind of policies that we, 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 we follow through. I mean, that, that I think is what, what uh, uh, is, is needed. You know, if we have an infrastructure program, uh, there must be the follow through in decisions taken at other levels of government and so on. So the more federalism you have, I think the less coherence you, talk, you often have in, in, in policy directions. So I, I'm not uh, in, in, in support generally of, 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 of federalism. Um, but of course, you do need to have uh, different, uh, um, you know, levels of government delivering different kinds of services, but not in the sort of way that you have, uh, you know, in, in Switzerland where, you know, cantons can opt out of all kinds of policies and so on and so forth. I don't think we need to go there. Uh, and certainly not uh, as, a, as a country which still needs uh, to develop. I would also, I mean, the, uh, the basic income grant, I would say, uh, is, is not in, 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 uh, in, in place of other things. Um, I think that we, we, we do need a national health insurance scheme, which has uh, currently been, 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 been tabled, uh, for precisely the reasons that, that we need to, to uh, pool the resources that are available to health in a, in a, in a different way than we've got in this country. Uh, we've got a, a, you know, about 15% of the population is consuming about 80% of the, the health resources, leaving 85% to consume the remaining 15%. Uh, and, I think that that is uh, something that, uh, that 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 cannot continue, uh, uh, and and uh, we, we we do need to, to move towards a a unified healthcare system as they have in uh, other countries, Britain, for example, Canada. Davi, no, 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 Rob, but Rob, that's that's very untrue. What you're saying is that that fifteen percent uh, that, that 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 the poor gets on health services, as an example, that is paid by the so-called rich by the taxpayer. So the taxpayer. Uh, the, 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 what you would call the rich people in South Africa, they pay for their own health services and they pay for the health services of the poor in South Africa. And I can prove to you that we've the, we have the most redistributive uh, fiscus in the, in, the, in, in, in the world. But, the, you know, uh, the good thing about having an incompetent government like what we have in South Africa is that they also cannot implement a bad idea. The NHI will not happen because we simply do not have the money. That's one. And simply because we don't have a government that's capable of implementing these sort of things. They've been trying for, for how many years now to, to make any progress in the NHI? They've made no progress. Just about no progress. But Donald, the interesting thing about what I've picked up from, from you, uh, Rob, and that is the difference between uh, in communism, there are, of course, like in, in a free market system or in socialism or in all these different isms, there are different schools of thought, and so in communism as well. And what I've picked up from Rob is that he is a Leninist. He's not, you are not a Marxist, Rob, you are a Len Leninist. Marx, Karl Marx, actually believed that the power should be with the people. And that's where the word Soviet comes from, because Soviet means local authority. I'm, by the way, married to, to, uh, to a Russian girl, and I've been to Russia many times. And that's what Karl Marx said, that the, uh, the power must be with the people, as close as possible to the people. The power must be with the Soviet, the local authority. But, but you believe, and that's what Lenin also said here, he wrote an essay called What is to be done, a very popular essay. And there in Karl Marx, uh, rather Vladimir Lenin or Vladimir Ilyanov, to use his real name, he did say that people are stupid. They don't, and we cannot allow people to take decisions on, on the economy, on very important things. We need to centralize the power and to, we have to take decisions on their behalf. And then we have to teach them about communism and politics and economics. And only after we've taught them about these things can we give the power back again. And that is what centralism, centralism is. That is what well, real um, communism is. I, I, first of all, I think that is a complete caricature of what Levin said. But in any case, leave that aside. Uh, I, I, I would say that the, the issue is, I, I was making the point earlier on, that it's a struggle over the powers of, uh, of economic ownership and the powers of possession. But powers of possession, are, I think, are extremely localized. Uh, you know, the, the, the way you, you, you operate a particular enterprise or you deliver a particular uh, 
community program, things like that are extremely decentralized. But at the same time, I think the powers of, of, of economic ownership, the powers of decision about the direction of the economy, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the structural challenges you face and the way you move forward, uh, those, I think, do require a pretty strong developmental state with a high level of coordination uh, with other levels of power. I mean, if you have, uh, you know, one province or one or a couple of municipalities that are going in a completely different direction, uh, then the uh, you know, ability of, of, of the developmental state to, 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 to reach its objectives and, 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 and of a process to, to achieve that is, is, is going to be uh, so much weakened. Uh, I don't think it has to be in an authoritarian way. And that's, that's the model we still have to, to develop. It has to be one of active participatory democracy. And I think at the moment what's happening is that whatever government comes in in many countries, which is why you get populism, whatever government comes in, uh, it doesn't really matter because the, uh, the policies, the main policies of the state are determined externally anyway, are determined by the power relations of capitalism in the world. Uh, and that many governments, it doesn't matter who you elect, you elect they're all going to, 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 to try to, 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 to manage the, the budget deficit down. They're going to, 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 to try to, to manage inflation down and prioritize all of those numbers over everything else. And I think that that is the, uh, the challenge and the problem that we have because that playbook has not delivered any kind of results. Uh, it's, uh, it's been imposed and it has been a recipe for continued underdevelopment of the, of the, of the third world. Okay, Davi, uh, sorry, uh, you, you can reply, but also can you also, we're, we're running out of time, so you can also yeah. conclude with your concluding statement. Yeah, yeah I just, uh, no, no, it's really weird for me to hear Rob uh, using words like um, authoritarian and democracy in the same sentence. I mean, uh, communist countries are not democracies. They are, are they're very, very far away from democracies. But anyway, maybe just a final concluding remark from me. Um, and while well, I've been an economist all my life and I've been trying to figure out what's going on in economics, and I think it's the most amazing subject. And I must tell you, really, I've, I've read this communist stuff and I've read and I've studied communism and, I, and it's really, I found it very, very interesting. I think it's hugely flawed. It is hugely flaws, flawed simply uh, because it, this thing that we call the economy is so so, so complex that a government or a committee or a minister simply cannot have enough information to decide how to allocate resources. This thing is far, far, far too complicated. And the biggest computer in the world will not be able to, to, to allocate scarce resources in a way uh, that, that the private sector can do it. And, and the, the wonderful thing about the markets is that they're self-correcting. Don't think for one moment that the, final, the free market is always coming to the right. It's always looking for the right answer. It's never finding it. It's always chasing the right answer. It's always readjusting things. And that's the difference uh, between a free market system and a communist system. In one system, you have a bunch of politicians pretending to know what's going on. They don't. And in the other system, you have the private sector continuously trying to find the truth, trying to chase the truth and never really finding it. But in the process, pulling the economy forward and in the process, creating this amazing more wealth that we've created the last couple of centuries in the world. And that is because of private property rights and the protection of individual rights. But the, maybe just a last comment of, that I would like to make. I think communism simply won't be able to work in the future. It will not be able to work in future because the nature of modern economies is information. It is information flow. Wealth creation today is not happening in the physical sectors anymore. It's not happening in the primary sector and the secondary sector. It's happening in the tertiary sector. That is primarily um, service-driven. It is it's, it's technological. It is digitizable. Uh, it's what we're doing now. It is You find it everywhere. You find it in finance. You find it in Googling. You find it in Facebook. All that, that's where wealth is actually created. It has become, it has become information. And politicians, socialist, communist politicians in the past, they could have control over us because they will simply steal your stuff because our, my stuff was physical stuff. In future, my stuff is not going to be physical stuff. My real value will be what I can do, my skills and my head. And no politician will be able to take that away from me. Rob, concluding remarks? 
Well, I think my concluding remarks are that um, I think that uh, free market capitalism has uh, delivered a world in which there is massive and wide inequality, in which there is monopoly conduct by uh, a very small number of corporations, where 3,500 individuals in South Africa own as much wealth as the, as the bottom uh, 90% of the population, and, uh, you know, uh, in which the needs and interests of the ordinary people of the world are not being placed at the, at the heart of, of decisions. Uh, I think that decisions are becoming more complex uh, and that uh, the uh, uh, increases of uh, digitization and technology are having an impact, but that digitization and technology also need to be subject uh, to much more social control and direction. If they are not, I think that we're going to see a widening digital divide between the haves and the have-nots of the world. Uh, I think we will not confront uh, challenges like climate change uh, if uh, we leave this to uh, a free market approach, uh, and that uh, we will not be uh, finding the appropriate solutions to uh, pandemics like the one that we're in at the moment, uh, and many future ones that will, that will emerge uh, if health services and the production of health uh, products uh, is uh, largely in the hand of profit-seeking institutions. So we've got to move. Uh, we've got to move away from the system and we've got to introduce more social control. There's no ready-made model for us to build on. We are at a stage, I think, as akin to when capitalism was emerging from feudalism. Uh, it was discovering the stepping stones that we need to, uh, to find uh, as we uh, take ourselves uh, to a future in which there is uh, production for social need and not production for private profit. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to both of you. Um, I've been quite passive during this debate, but it was still very interesting to watch and to listen. If you've made it this far to our viewers, please consider liking, sharing it and uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel. My name is Donald. This has been Worldview. Thank you very much, Donald. Rob, I just want to say that I really think you're a good guy and I didn't want to get personal, so my apologies if I was getting too personal. No, it was okay, don't worry. I don't have any problem with it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, never Thank mind. You, but I, 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 find you, I find you interesting too when I hear on the radio from time to time, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. And it, it would be very nice to have a beer with you, I must say. I, I don't drink alcohol, but I'll have a, a coffee with you. Okay. No, okay, whatever, cheers. Whatever.